Buenos días a todos. Muchas gracias por participar. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being part once again of this cycle of webinars. Uh, today's webinar will be about cloud architectures, backend technologies, and interventions. First, the speakers will introduce themselves, and then they will make a brief presentation. Finally, we will have a Q&A session at the end. The idea is for you to turn off your cameras and open your microphones when you want to ask questions. So without further ado, I hand over the microphone to the speakers, Gonzalo. Hello, everyone. My name is Gonzalo Galotti. I work in the development team of Genexus, specifically in backend and web. Well, I'm next, I guess. My name is Claudia Morialdo. I work in backend, especially in .NET and NetCore. Hello, everyone. My name is Sabrina Juarez. I am working in the development team. Good afternoon, my name is Andres Cabrera and I work in the support team at Genexus. Hello, good afternoon, my name is Alejandro Panita. I also work in the development team in web development and services. Hello, my name is Gaston Milano and I work in the development team at Genexus as well. I'm Ignacio Roqueta and I work in development, especially in Java. Good afternoon, my name is Martin Villarolo and I've been working for about a year on the Java Narrator in, as part of the development team. Well, great. Thank you all for being here in this uh, talk, which will take approximately 10 minutes. We will discuss some things that we worked on at Genexus on backend, cloud and integration. If we were to summarize what was the main focus of this 2021, it was technological update of generators, integration, and cloud. These were the core pillars on which we focused this year. In terms of technological update, the .NET platform was the one that suffered the greatest changes because Microsoft, pressured by the industry, especially because of not having a cross-platform, had to rebuild .NET. So after 2014, Microsoft has released five new versions of .NET, which means that you need to have at least two yearly updates, two annual updates. As a consequence of this, the .NET uh, framework platform that we knew has been discontinued and is only updated uh, in a very minor way and has created Net5 and Net6, which will keep on evolving. Net5 and Net6 have implied many changes in terms of programming, and you need a lot of changes uh, in the code. But the good news for everyone and for us is that Genexus, after the 17th version and Net5, we have support for Net5. So we can begin to convert our applications into Net5 and Net6. As a matter of fact, Net6 that has not yet been released is already compatible with the next uh, upgrade seven of Genexus. So why would you like to move on to Net5 and Net6? Mainly due to the fact that it's the natural evolution of the .NET platform. Secondly, we will get better performance, better compilation. We will be able to run side-by-side -side applications, which means that we will not have to update the framework versions of all the server to run applications in different versions all the time. It will be open source, which is going to give it a, a, a greater speed uh, for development in the platform. And probably the most important uh, thing is that from now on, applications are cross-platform, which means that you will be able to run them on Linux, Windows, and containers. If you want to delve into these issues, I would really recommend you to attend Claudia Morialdo's uh, talk. She will be talking about .NET and Azure and all the news around this world and what things we're doing at Genexus. Also, uh, as far as the Java world is concerned, what happened is that due to legal reasons, Java uh, had to become Jakarta 
uh, had to be renamed as Jakarta. So all the internal packages at Java had to change as well. And that implied that we needed to rewrite all the standard classes and access to, to provide support to Jakarta, which is, the, which is Java's evolution. And in this way, it, it can support the last uh, versions of Tomcat, such as Tomcat 10. Also, we need to do a lot of improvements to uh, the generator and security. And last, in terms of uh, friendly URLs, well, recently we began to work with these web applications in order to have URL rewrites, which is based on uh, patch mode. We also introduced a new property to decide in which way you want to uh, get the parameters. For example, uh, if you want to name them in a certain way, and in this way you can have URLs that meet the industry standards. And also we did, we made some adjustments. For example, we took Java, uh, we took the word servlet uh, from the Java code and we made a lot of changes and improvements in that regard. The next point is integration. This is one of probably the most important things nowadays. Uh, it's becoming more and more important to integrate with other applications. And the best way to do that today is through web services. On GenXS 17, we have support to expose services, such as, for example, consuming services based on Open Up API 2.0 and Open API 3.0. So through uh, this inspector, in a matter of seconds, you can consume any API, any web API that is external without having to write a single line of code. In terms of exposing an API, the best way to do this on GenXS 17 is working with the API object, which allows us to model the API of our interface and our systems in a centralized way and in a very clear way. This replaces the old mechanism that we had which could be a bit cumbersome because it was not so intuitive. And now we have a central object that allows us to declare our API, declare which verbs these methods will attend, whether it's a put or a get, we will be able to add mediation code and also support new protocols that may come up in the future, such as GPRC and so on and so forth. Another important thing is that when we design an API object, GeneXus automatically creates the open API that you can send to your clients so that they can consume services in an easy way. So API object nowadays, we could say that it's the solution to expose APIs to third parties. This is a very comprehensive topic. I would also recommend you to attend Eugenio Garcia's talk. He'll be talking to us about APIs and how to integrate with other systems and protocols. As far as cloud is concerned, we worked on uh, several lines. We have a line on storage and data, another one on distributed apps, uh, then deployment and finally serverless. I'll talk to you briefly about what we did in each of these aspects. In terms of storage, uh, on GeneXus 16, uh, that supports uh, file storage, blog storage, and audio and video storage, uh, whether it's on Azure, Google, or IBM, well, this year what we did was we completed the solution uh, to give support to private objects. And these objects can be served with URLs that have an expiration. We also added the Minio support, which is a platform of, uh, similar to Amazon S3 that allows us to use the same tools that we use on the cloud, but on the premises. In terms of databases, we are working to incorporate DynamoDB uh, a gen access. For those of you that don't know it, Dynamo, DynamoDB is a non-SQL database on the cloud that allows us to have unlimited scalability with a very, very low operational cost and maintenance cost. This Dynamo technology uh, came up to a solution uh, to problems in which scalability or relational costs were not enough. 
uh, Genexus, we will be able to access these systems, uh, which are scalable by using the same concepts that we use nowadays for other more traditional things, such as transactions, uh, commands, and so on and so forth. So in the same way that you work with the SQL Server or MySQL, you will be able to incorporate or to use in our development non-SQL mechanisms. And DynamoDB is uh, the first one in that line. This is something that we're working on and we hope that will be done by the end of this year. If we think about cloud applications, I think that inevitably we need to think about the fact that our applications will be executed in a distributed way with uh, several nodes and a lot of instances at the same time. Uh, GenXus 17, we focused on trying to solve load balancing. Uh, and to do so, we worked on trying to have our cache layers, our session layers in a distributed way. And that will allow us to work in the best possible way in distributed environments, such as the ones, for example, that uh, happen in the cloud. In terms of deployment, historically, we've always been very open in terms of deployment. We, you can deploy it in the way that you want in your Genexus application, both on-premise or on the cloud, or uh, IaaS, containers, you name it. But we believe that in the short and midterm, we will be deploying uh, our systems in containers. Uh, as a matter of fact, Gartner, the consulting company, uh, foresaw that by 2022, more than 75% 75, 75 of global organizations will be running containerized applications in production, which is showing us how relevant containers are today, and that we believe that in a not so distant future, this will be the best way to deploy our applications. So uh, on GenXus 17, we strongly focused on containers, we want to be very well prepared. Nowadays, you can deploy it on GenXus 17, your applications using Docker uh, that may later on be deployed in any container uh, provider such as Azure or Google or IBM or a local environment or Amazon Elastic Container Services. So this is a trend that I believe will become stronger and stronger. We need to be prepared. And so we've been working a lot on that to keep on making progress and improving the experience in this containerizing uh, phase. Last but not least, we have a new deployment model or architecture model of what is called serverless. And maybe you've heard about it before. Nowadays, this is very used. It's a model that we use to, it's the model that we use to build the COVID-19 vaccination system for the Uruguayan government that needed to be able to process a load of more than 1 million people simultaneously. This was the scenario that we had to face. And this model allowed us to have that scalability that was necessary. Usually serverless models are really effective for those scenarios in which demand is completely unpredictable, whether because of its high scalability, such as the vaccination system was in Uruguay, or perhaps because you have systems that you use just a few times uh, over the day and it makes no sense to have a server running for 24 hours because you're paying for what you get and you don't need to, um, and you can test your code and the platform does the rest for you. So this serverless deployment consists of three components. First of all, you deploy, uh, your, your, your APIs are distributed on an API gateway, then you deploy your code on a uh, on Lambda. And finally, you use a database engine of maximum scalability, such as DynamoDB. And using these three components, you can have uh, unlimited scalability for applications without having to plan the load and working with just one server. What is the idea that we have a Genexus in terms of serverless? Well, we believe that we will be able to deploy API objects on this uh, serverless model, that we will be able to run service-oriented applications such as Angular, iOS, or Android. 
and we will be able to execute batch tasks, which are the typical demons that we have in these applications that we need sometimes uh, to work with web servers just to uh, run demons, to execute demons. Well, in this serverless world, you can do it in an automatic way. This is an example of Microsoft Azure and well, how to deploy this uh, function that should be executed every five minutes. And what is the state of the art today? Well, on the Azure cloud, we have it implemented and you can already try it in the preview of the uh, U7 of GenX, uh, the, the upgrade seven of GenX 17. And for the Amazon cloud, we will add it uh, very, very soon. For those of you that are interested in this uh, topic, uh, there will be a talk about uh, state-of-the-art Amazon Amazon Engine X's uh, with Gonzalo Galotti, myself, and we will be talking about uh, this world and how this enables us, uh, enables us to have different kinds of architecture. So this is the most important thing that we needed to highlight today, probably the three pillars on which we focused and on which we will focus. So thanks a lot for your time. And now I'm going to hand over the microphone to Aníbal for him to uh, move on, move us on to the Q&A session. I have a couple of questions that we have received, but if you want to ask uh, a question with your microphones open, maybe that would be a good place to start. Hello. Okay, so I'm going to start with one of the questions that we have. Is it possible to access other uh, non relational database handlers? Well, that is exactly what Gonzalo just uh, talked about. Uh, by default, we are having uh, access to relational uh, databases through relational data sources. Nowadays, you can access different kinds of handlers through different external objects that you have. For instance, uh, message queues or DynamoDB or other technologies uh, for that matter. We started with this a couple of years ago, and you could say that nowadays we are giving it its final polishes so that we can uh, have it up and running at the end of the year. Um, you can work with declared data sources such as Dynamo, DB, Mongo, Cosmo. They could be declared as another data source. And of course, they will have some limitations because of the very nature of the technology of why, what we use these uh, data sources for. Uh, limitations of the kind of, if you do a join, for example, maybe the specifier will tell you that you're unable to do that. But in the most traditional cases for which you're using these handlers will be contemplated and you will be able to have access to that. Um, today, you can just do it uh, working through external objects and we want that to be better integrated to the traditional way of having access to GeneXus. Some data sources, such as the ones that I mentioned, which are table-oriented, uh, will be uh, modeled through a data source. Some others, we will create a new abstraction uh, similar to data sources, such as, for example, message queues. And for that, in the in the environment part, we will create some elements to declare these message queues that have a different na a nature in terms of how you access them. But we will be working really hard on this for uh, in, uh, that in the future to, to get better modeling. And we have some specs around it that we want to incorporate. Okay, another question then. We've been working, uh, we've been talking about microservices for the past two years. Is it possible to work with a lot of services uh, and microservices with GenXus? Well, that, that's a question that I've been asked um, 
several times, and the short answer is yes. The long answer is, well, uh, first you need to know that you could be getting into trouble if you believe that you need to do microservices without uh, analyzing the architecture of the system and why you would like to uh, work with microservices. As you move towards not so monolithic architecture, what you will begin to come across are redundancy issues, data maintenance, uh, inconsistencies that, yeah, I mean, you, you can do it, it is feasible, but you need to really analyze who owns the data, uh, which modules own the data. And there is a there is a talk that Gonzalo will be, Gonzalo Chawe will be giving a talk about this uh, on what you can do today. We will also want to model some of these uh, things. So the first step that we took was deployment units, but then we will keep on trying to model around it. Yeah, we have some, some questions from the audience. Okay, so that, that's great. Carlos Benitez asked us, is it possible to read and write data on the IoT broker of uh, iOS? I guess that he is... Uh, so, is it possible to read and write data on the broker of the IoT of uh, AWS? Yeah, I mean, you can. I don't know if you have an external object that you need to work with and whether that's going to be uh, dealt with in a similar way to Kafka, but maybe Gonzalo, you have some insights on this. Yeah, well, the same thing as you that's done today with an external object you could integrate, but we have nothing that is native for IoT AWS. Javier Fernandez also asked uh, something about DynamoDB. Is Genexus going to work with DynamoDB in the same way that they did with the SQL Server? That means uh, in terms of maintenance? So the first step now is we're not going to do maintenance, but we will uh, take care of the of the access to DynamoDB from a declared uh, database. So it's in, it's going to be, in a way, an external data source, and you will be able to have access to that. But uh, you will not, we will not be doing maintenance at the very beginning. Then probably this is something that we need to analyze thoroughly, because uh, the maintenance uh, may be extremely expensive in terms of uh, money and in terms of time. So moving from one table to the other is something that could be not very feasible. To, I mean, when I say not feasible, I mean, if you have one million registries, that, that is something that doesn't sound crazy. Moving that to a new table will require a scan and will begin to uh, get things on Dynamo that would not be advisable. Since it is something that is dynamic, it would be great to add something. Uh, but uh, treating or dealing with a Dynamo uh, database is quite different from the typical thinking on optimization of a relational database. And therefore, there are some instances in which on the same table, you have three columns, one for each version. And in that way, you, you, you can just avoid, you know, that hard work we didn't believe it like at first that that is the most relevant relevant thing based on the experience of other systems that are using dynamo db but the the most important thing is having access to those tables and well maintenance is something to to be considered because as i said could could not it might not be feasible but it's something that we will analyze Enrique Almeida asked us, what would be the recommendation of moving existing developments on GeneXus to incorporate these new functionalities? For instance, I want to move an application that is existing working on the cloud. Uh, what would be uh, the steps to be taken or how to move uh, a monolithic application uh, for it to work with uh, as independent services? Uh, Gonzalo, I don't want to hog, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let someone else uh, answer. Give it a go, Gonzalo. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. You have experience. 
Enrique, if you mean new functionalities such as uh, Dynamo and serverless, one thing that we know for sure is that these things do not intend to replace what we already have. So it's impossible to think about moving relational uh, databases to non-SQL databases because you will have so many limitations that the platform itself will make it uh, not feasible, implausible. So for example, with the uh, vaccination uh, scheduling system, it was a massive uh, system and the, the web layer that was working with the million people that wanted to get the vaccine well, that, that module made sense. So that sub-module was thought to be in the cloud uh, and incorporated some of the new functionalities. So I think that it's something that you can do as a good strategy if you think about it per module. But as I said, there are some things that these technologies uh, always seem to be great at doing. Uh, there are some clear scenarios in which they work and there are some other scenarios in which maybe they are not the most recommended thing to do. It's always about, I think, trying to find that, that, that sweet spot uh, for it to work. Okay, with existing developments, what happens is that when I want to incorporate this functionality, I need to uh, allow it to exist a new and an old KB. If I want to incorporate in a part of my KB S3 as storage, for instance, and you can't do that everywhere, you know, that, that, that's a that's an issue. So I'd be needing, uh, I, I, I'm not saying that everybody does, but I, I need some guidelines or some best practices of how to go from older stuff to newer stuff. Even though this does not represent a full uh, development change. Well, I don't think that we have a silver bullet today, but that was something that was mentioned uh, in the talk that I gave, which is about having uh, understanding the data modeling, which of course you, you, you would understand in your case. And also understanding in that separation that you want to have due to deployment speed or because you want to work with faster versions, because some parts of the systems are evolving faster than other parts of the system. Developments could be the issue, you name it. Uh, in any case, if you model the data and the first thing that you do is you say, okay, I want to separate this module and conceptually in your data modeling, in your data modeling, you can separate who owns a, a share or a portion of, of the data. Uh, well, in the vaccination system, that was pretty straightforward because we were not going to uh, manage the, the the scheduling and the timetables, uh, but we were working with the queues of people that were registering. So if you wanted to know whether or not someone had uh, an appointment for a vaccination, then you knew who owned the system, that it was, for example, a MySQL on-premises old database, but as that was going to be accessed by a million people that had to be replicated on Dynamo so that that could be accessed by other services, which was in this case a microservice that had access to Dynamo to know the status of the vaccination. What happened several times in this case was that you needed to refresh that information because you couldn't give uh, anyone direct ac access to, to the old system because basically it would collapse. So having that clear definition of who owns the data and what portion of data they own and what the partitions are allows us to eventually come up with a development with uh, two different backends, while at the same time working with manual systems. Yeah, I always get, I think, to the same conclusion that the, the way is to get first through modules. Uh, and then defining who owns the data, such as Gonzalo and you said today, that was very clear. Uh, and I also agree with that. And I think that it would be nice to leave, uh, to, to model data ownership, because I'm interested that no one can modify those data in my module, uh, that someone can read that, but cannot 
to change that and that would be that would be nice so uh, I, I don't want to hog it again so you know it's uh Cuando Enrique dice este... yeah, when Enrique, I wanted to add something. When Enrique says uh, for the application to work on the cloud, I think that's a very broad statement in a way because, yeah, you have a serverless with a DynamoDB, but you have some in-between steps. For example, that blobs work on standard storage of an S3 type. That is something that you can do and you can do it just with attributes. You don't need to do the whole thing with a KB. You can just start with some attributes. Then you have... Redis for data caches, sessions that you can save that will allow you to scale up without uh, having everything on the same server. So you can do it step by step. And if you want to get to the extreme of serverless with DynamoDB, then you need to think about the fact that it will need to be one of these architectures applied to services. Uh, with the traditional web generator, for example, you would have to work with with Angular. Yes, uh, I think it's clear where I am and where I can get to, but the in-between steps in my very personal perceptions uh, seem a bit confusing. What could work for me? And that is a bit scary, you know, uh, that, that initial uh, step is, is a bit scary, but hey, come on, I mean... Yeah, I don't think that we have a single recipe, but you need to work on having some some clear parts of, of these things that we're discussing. So that was that was a great question. Thank you, Enrique. I, I would address the main pain points, you know, Enrique, and how to tackle that. Because you know, it, it, it's not about what's about to happen; it's about what's what's happening. Scalability. Maybe you need your data to be stored in a certain place. You need. Uh, you need to share an API, so maybe you can start with just one API. Yeah, that, that, that was what I was saying. I've got a huge um, KB, and I want to be able to install it uh, separately, for instance, in different servers. Maybe deploy um, some things on one server and some other things on other servers for the sake of scalability or security. But that is always like entailing uh, further changes and you start pulling the thread and you will see that there is a, a huge number of things, a great number of things that you need to do. So, uh, uh, just a comment, Enrique, on that. Are you working with deployment units to separate all these uh, different parts of things that you want to deploy? Yes, yes, with a lot of pain, but yeah. Deployment units, I think, take more than they should. But regardless of that, which can be adjusted conceptually, you're already separating in different web apps, your, your, your back office, your front end, your um, service layers. Okay. Yeah, more than 20, as a matter of fact. Okay. Because that's the strategy. Yeah. Enrique, how are you going? Salud, Chavo here. I loved your talk. I, I, I recommend it to everyone here. Basically, going from a monolith to a mini services action, you're sharing the same KB, all the deployment units, and I understand that you're sharing the database. So you have no table redundancy on different databases, but you have the same database, or you want to go there, right? No, no, I'm not working, I'm not talking about a particular project. I have a number of things that are happening, uh, some of which uh, mean that, for example, I have a system and now I want it to be in the cloud. Um, Perhaps I've got, uh, I need to install something in one server because there is a requirement. So it's not just one project in particular. And A, I'm making two, but the thing is that I feel that I'm at times reinventing the, the wheel or trying to, you know, to make my own way for each case. And maybe this is something that the whole community could come up with as a solution. So we need to perhaps pave the way uh, for it to be easier. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next question. Javier Fernandez said, I see that the implementation of microservices uh, I can answer that question. 
in terms of the deployment of services and functions, uh, we're implementing that on Amazon and Azure at the same time. Everything that we do on Azure, we also do it on Amazon and vice versa. Uh, regarding Google and other clouds, Gaston, maybe you can uh, shed some light. Yeah, the same thing, right? And like, we have some specific things that we need to, well, we want to have two clouds, such as Amazon's and Microsoft, which nowadays are leading in the industry for uh, these applications. And then you have a IBM's cloud, which is a cloud in which you can already deploy, uh, thanks to its open shield condition. We have all the technology to, to do that with a, with a Java application. So probably we will keep on working uh, once we have the basic set of uh, high scalability applications that we can build both on the Amazon cloud as well as on the Microsoft uh, cloud. In between, what Gonzalo was saying is that we have uh, container deployment. So that is also something to focus on. And almost every cloud that uh, supports this, which is well, all the ones that we mentioned, uh, Alibaba, Google, they can all support container deployment and they have the service to deploy containers. Uh, and we will we will do it in those cases. But of course, each of them each of them have a different kind of storage service uh, service. For example, you don't have that on Alibaba, but you will need to have it eventually. So to complete all the services of all the clouds is an extremely daunting task. Uh, it takes time, and so on this in, in this 2021, we wanted to focus on services on, on caching on non-relational databases, on message queues, uh, event streams, on Microsoft and Azure. And maybe we have a fallback, which is to deploy in containers, which is supported by uh, all the clouds. And so you can deploy it wherever you want. But with the particular services, we will be working as these um, clouds evolve. All the services of all existing clouds can be easily consumed. They have a JavaScript, .NET, Java, and SDK that, that can be easily integrated. So as you were, you were asking today, what if I want to integrate with event stream? Well, you can do that really fast. So uh, for instance, in the vaccination project, we didn't have the SQS integration with Java. And today we have a project that that, that is doing this integration for GenXs uh, with SQS directly. And we did it in a couple of days. We we had um, very quickly the external object. These are very simple APIs. Yeah, so I think that's that's the way. Uh, this year, Amazon Web Services and Azure, and then we will keep on working with services from other clouds. Xiomara Mendoza asks us, can you do some reverse engineering uh, in a non-relational database, perhaps Dynamo or MongoDB? Yeah, when we talk about re reverse engineering, I think that what, what she means is that you can uh, connect to a DynamoDB or MongoDB database and get the tables as a GeneXus transaction. Uh, well, that is what we are doing. Uh, what we were telling you about with Dynamo, you can uh, get the connection string uh, of Amazon to Dynamo. Genexus presents it as if it were a data B generator. You have the tables, and then you can get them as associated transactions. MongoDB is one that is on the list as the next item. Um, it's the next item on the list. What we're doing now is an abstraction with uh, MongoDB uh, so as to be able to restrict those uh, DBMS, those uh, non-relational handlers, because they have a lot of limitations. And for instance, you can't work with an interface uh, worldwide 
in this case, you know, with Mongo or Dynamo, it's maybe you can, but some things are just like implausible. Unless they have been declared in a certain way, that's that's going to be, you know, not, 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 you, you will not be able to do that. So you're working, we are working on those limitations and the modeling of that. We also have a question from Rodrigo that says, in a concept test with an existing system with Genexus 17 U5 generator C sharp, we compiled to Netcore, executed on IIS, and the performance was notoriously uh, lower. Is there any additional configuration or setup to take into account? Claudia, sorry, you're muted. No, still nothing. What about now? Yeah, good. No, decía que no, no hay una configuración especial. We don't have a specific setup. We would have to take a look at the particular case. You said that it was on IIS, right? Yeah, probably we should take a look at uh, data access, perhaps multiple records. There could be a, some issue there. We should see what, what, what they mean by this uh, performance aspect, if it is something that is general or it's a service that and against what DBMS, right? Perhaps it could be a, a driver thing. Yeah, there are so many variables. Uh, but if it's a system that was, uh, if it's a build all system, then, you know, initially, nothing apart from the generator has changed, has it? Yeah, but Claudia, I was thinking about, um, you know, for example, MRU that is not supported by some net core drivers or maybe, yeah, multiple registries. Yeah. Well, maybe that could be it. But it's not because of what we are doing. Perhaps it's a programming uh, thing that, that could be being solved on the client side. Yeah, it's something to look into. Uh, I don't know, Rodrigo, perhaps you can you can share your contact so that we can take a look at the specific case later on. But uh, yeah, okay, great. I, I will send you the contact. Rodrigo Medina is the name. Great, Rodrigo. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll reach you later. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We have a question by Carlos Benitez. She's asking us something that, that was asked, I think, at the beginning. Is there any integration with IoT of AWS? And if there is, which one is it? Uh, in terms of IoT, I understand that Amazon IoT supports the MQTT protocol, which is uh, for message queues. And at Genexus, we have an external object for C Sharp that I can, I can send you the link later on that allows you to work, uh, to, to connect to this MQTT protocol. Because in this way you could work using that external object. We don't have other ways. Uh, so if there is something additional, you would need to create an external object and connect to this uh, service. And you know that usually Amazon's SSKs are usually friendly, so that, that's, uh, no big deal. If you want, I can share the link for MQTT for you to take a look at it and see if it works for you. Any other questions? Sorry, if there are no questions, then I can I can ask another one. In the multiple uh, interconnected KBs scenario that share either data views or services, 
digamos, me parece que tenemos el suficiente conocimiento en cada uno. Una... We have enough knowledge in each point to have more information. For instance, what I'm trying to say is the way to export a data view or a KB to another one usually goes through the database so that you don't have to rewrite it. I create the table on the database and then I import it on the other KB, losing information such as domains, more detailed, uh, more specific data. So couldn't we think about something such as exporting a table as a data view from GeneXus itself? The same thing for services. When I have two KBs that I'm uh, that I'm developing myself, and I have a published service, when that changes, I would like to uh, know before I deploy it. So perhaps have a uh, a way, a mechanism to to find out beforehand. Uh, I didn't get the second point there, Enrique. The first the first point, yes. Uh, one of the things that we did was to. Uh, yeah, export transactions. I think it's uh, along the same lines of trying to uh, to improve. So yeah, we'll take it as a, as a suggestion to try to get uh, data views and tables and export it uh, easily so that you don't have to refine that. that. That was very clear, but I didn't really get the second part of it. I've got the KB1 that calls a service that, that will be uh, on KB2 and I add or I take a parameter on one side and, and then the signature of the service uh, changes. So instead of having to publish the other one and getting the definition back, perhaps doing it in an, in an easier way. One of the things that we have still, that, that we're still working on parallel in parallel is GeneXus platform. Nowadays, KB don't know each other. You don't have an aggregator on, uh, above KBs that, that allows you to say, if you wanted to find an architecture that's distributed uh, with, I don't know, uh, five KBs, then where would you uh, save that document? Where is that document saved? Well, that is uh, nowhere. Or maybe it is saved in one of them that is the owner of the document and then it needs to be sent to the other one. So the same thing happens with services. You don't have a discovery place because I would also like, for example, to imagine that we are working on project uh, one and all KBs in that project should know which is the services repository for the other KBs. So you have someone in the project, which is the concept that we incorporated in uh, on GeneXus platform, which is, okay, project one has these KBs and then maybe an architecture diagram would make sense. And uh, the KB that implements it and a services diagram as well. So uh, I know that it feels like uh, I'm, I'm saying that it's something that will come but trying to be more pragmatic, nowadays one uh, KB does not have a point to a services or a place where you can check. So we should get specifications for that, and we have nothing in that sense, and not not we, not even uh, something that will be done soon. But we do have some macro projects w w in which we may add this extra KB vision because inter-KB uh, stuff nowadays, there is nothing that is external that can orchestrate or coordinate uh, for you to tell you, for, for it to tell you something like, okay, this changed, so you can do it automatically. Perhaps you could work with a pipeline automatically, but you need to program that basically, so. Yeah, and the same thing with modules, right? Uh, if you publish a binary module, it's the same. I understand that it's connected to what you said at the beginning of having a repository for all that, but, um, in the meantime, yeah. In terms of modules, we believe that we can, uh, that we will be able to specify, for example, with NPM, etc. Uh, I can say, for example, instead of an X version of a module in which you're tied to something, you can call it like latest, which is not always good, 
but well if you're developing something then it's good and then uh, it should be like fixed versions or at least in one environment in particular but that is something that we would like to have we don't have the dependency between modules either which is quite uh, which is a a pain when you want to reset things because eventually between KBs one service could be exposed through a module and so if you get the the latest one when you're setting it up then it's going to tell you that that is wrong and they need to re-import it which is not ideal but it's you know it's it's helping you uh, it's telling you that it's broken that the build's not working and so that allows you to see what you want to do because if it's going to uh, break and you know that you don't want it to be out on the streets but we will be working a lot with uh, this in terms of trying to automate and having different options because you don't always want to get uh, the latest versions or dependencies so that is more connected to modeling rather than uh, I don't believe that it will have a repercussion on uh, the implementation let's say Okay, this is it. We are out of time. So thank you so much for your participation. Thanks a lot to the team. Uh, this webinar is going to be uploaded on our website, which is uh, genexus slash webinar. And you can register for all the events that we'll have from now on till mid-December. It's a very uh, busy uh, timetable. So thanks a lot. Thank you all for coming and I'll be seeing you soon. Bye-bye.